we'll, uh, we're going to kick it off with uh, John, who's our next presenter. He is the co-founder and managing director of ETP, the Enterprise Tran- Transformation Partners. He has years of experience working to introduce and scale the use of interoperable solutions into the resource sector. John's team operate the UWA Energy Resources Digital Interoperability I4.0 Test Lab. And I only say that once. It's called ERID, E-R-D-I, ERDI, someone said before. Is that an acceptable, you can just say ERDI? Great, you guys, you guys would know better. Um, which was established as part of the Australian Industry 4.0 Test Lab Network. It is a pillar of the federal government's Industry 4.0 strategy, and it's underpinned by the Australian-German collaboration on Industry 4.0. The ETP team have successfully led and designed uh, the implementation of the first I4 interoperable solution in open pit and underground mining globally, uh, working with multiple mining software vendors to enhance their software products to support their I4 standards. Um, So with that, I don't don't know where you've gone. John, out the back. Uh, thanks, Beck, and thanks to Datamine for inviting me along today. Uh, I'm just going to do a presentation um, around Mine Market um, and the Industry 4.0 implementation uh, of Mine Market and successes we've had there. Um, I'll give a little bit of um, context first on Industry 4.0. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about it, but I'll just give you there's a there's probably a few insights that I can pass on that um, might pique your interest and in something to look into further. But I won't spend too much time on it. Um, So, yeah, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, where did it all come from? I'll skip past this first, this first slide, but essentially we've had, you know, um, automation and computers for a fair while now. Um, So what's the, what's the big deal with this fourth industrial revolution? Um, They use the term cyber physical systems, which I don't think really uh, represents what it's all about too well. Um, But essentially it's around... um, integration and information sharing across distributed systems, um, basically having the right information in the right system that you're going to use to perform a, a process or a function in a business um, at the right time, which is whenever it's available anywhere else in the organisation, um, and then doing that through standard ways of communicating information so you can have best in breed technologies uh, in your organisation whenever new technologies come out in the market, you can, you can actually apply that to your business and take advantage of that. Um, so it kicked off really in Germany, uh, a bunch of round tables they have regularly between industry, um, manufacturing, uh, technology, academia and government, make sure Germany stays at the forefront uh, around mass production, manufacturing and on the technology scene, you know, there's quite a few big companies out of Germany, Bosch, Siemens and the like. Um, and what they were sort of, um, what was coming up, a lot of these regular round tables at that period of time was that they were starting to struggle with the fact that a lot of the um, consumers, whether they be other businesses or, you know, um, at home, were wanting a lot more bespoke products, which is putting a strain on the whole design and manufacturing process from a mass production uh, perspective. Um, and the other thing is there's all these advances in technology that they wanted to take advantage of and apply, but it was really difficult to apply that into their manufacturing organisations, typically constrained by three monolithic systems, process control, MES and, um, and ERP. Um, so trying to get specialist applications to fit in there and integrate and try things out and leverage you know, AI, whether it be best used for analytics or in scheduling or execution optimization, really difficult to do when you cannot add these specific models into your stack and, and take advantage of them um, with encumbrances around integration and, and data access. So um, I suppose the conversations must have got to the point that they decided to put some funding in there um, and work out what they needed to do. So they had a vision of this highly flexible um, manufacturing operating model. And when I use manuf- the term manufacturing quite broad, any, any physical goods industry, So mining fits into that, oil and gas, um, you know, in contrast to a services industry or service functions within a business. Um, So they had this vision of this highly flexible to change, market change or technology change operating model. Um, They had a vision based around that and worked out how much value would be uh, available if they could achieve this. And then they worked out, well, what would all the things um, that aren't true today that would need to be true to make this a reality because it's definitely not true today. so as part of that, they developed this uh, document called the RAMI architecture or reference architecture model industry 4.0. And it basically pinpointed 
these are all the things that are encumbering us to be able to achieve this operating model. Therefore, work has to be done to move us to this, this point of maturity across a whole bunch of different processes and standards and technologies to enable that envisaged operating model. Um, once they had that in place, they were like, oh, that, that's a lot of work. Um, so they, they did some planning and said they think it'll take to 2030 to actually achieve this, foot their vision, their envisioned manufacturing operation where it was completely optimized through the use of technology, best technology, feeding all other data around. Um, and so this, this diagram in the center here, I don't know if I've got a mouse or something there. Oh, uh, yep. Uh, that's a, just a model out from the reference architecture. This is their vision, the three pillars of their vision around autonomy, sustainability, and interoperability. Um, and with that lot of work, what they also recognized was that um, they not a, need to run a big program of work. They need to put a lot of money into it, but they also need to collaborate with uh, countries around the world. So they established um, a number of different sub-organizations to this program of work uh, called Platform Ministry 4.0. There's websites, you can read a bunch about it, supported by the World Economic Forum. Um, one of them was the lab networks for Industry 4.0. Basically, these were all set up and established at uh, universities and research organizations as a common place that industry and technology and others could come together and work through these, um, these issues and solve these challenges. And then the other thing was around the standardization council. Um, standards was a big part of the solution. So the goal was not to go and reestablish standards from scratch, but work with existing standards organizations and enhance standards that already existed, but enough to close the gap um, that still existed in those standards today. Um, so the Standardisation Council um, basically would be set up to engage with the IEC or ISA or ISO on particular standards to put forward their case for change and, and manage that through. Um, so Australia, the German government also wanted to collaborate with all different countries to get this across the road. Um, and so they signed up agreements with between the German government and various other governments over the years and Australia signed up in 2016. Um, so that's the front page of the agreement. I think there's only two or three pages in it. Um, but essentially the first sort of port of call for Australia was to establish um, a mirror of the lab networks um, with Germany. Um, and I'll go to the next slide just so you can see that a little bit better. Um, so there was a program to establish one per state Victoria got two actually, RMIT should be there as well. I think because the guy running the whole thing was from Victoria, from RMIT. Um, but essentially it was a competitive bid for the universities. Um, and that's where um, we got involved with the University of Western Australia around um, co-designing, established the, the UWA test lab. Um, Cause it just happened that from previous years experience working in the mining industry on some interoperability standards, the standards that we worked on for many years, um, actually were in the Industry 4.0 reference architecture. Um, so validated against Industry 4.0 and a lot of the work that we contributed to those standards um, was taken on in 20, 000, uh, 2019-2020. So what do we do at the test lab? Um, it's pretty simple really. There's still a bunch of gaps in the standards that we can't um, leverage um, in mining in terms of they don't exist for certain um, use cases. Um, so where, there, where there's gaps in the standards, we'll conduct research and development with miners and technology companies to close those gaps and establish the standards. Um, we'll run proof of concepts as part of that process. Um, we'll showcase technology um, when it does support the standards. So you can actually come down to the lab, it's open to anyone, and you'll be able to see a demonstration of a number of software packages from different vendors working together as I'll describe later in the uh, slides and mind markets, one of the key applications that we show in the demos. Um, and then we'll do education, uh, workforce enablement, uh, both through UWA and South Metro TAFE. Um, and this one at the bottom um, is we offer um, technology conformance testing. So buyers can understand whether a, soft, a certain software package or hardware supports the standards and verify it against that as well. So we mainly do that in the process control space. All right, interoperability, I better explain what that's all about. Um, so there's a, you know, interoperability can be used in a whole different type of, um, you know, uh, references and use cases, but with respect to what I'm talking about today, it's around um, software interoperability based on standard messages. Um, 
and standard semantics um, around the structure of the messages and the master data that you share between applications. So um, there's a bit of a blurb there. There's a, take a photo and type that into, um, I, I guess you share the slides afterwards, I guess. Um, there's a link there, you can go to an article, try to explain to my mum what I've been doing for the last 10 years uh, in that. So it talks about wheels and websites and tries to make some sort of relationship towards interoperability. Um, but in the day, it's about having the right information in the right place at the right time. Um, there's been a massive fascination with getting data from sensors and IoT and systems into a data warehouse or data lake for analytics and data scientists. Whereas that's no help to the scheduler if they need that understanding of the balances of the material and the grades because they're doing blend scheduling in their scheduling software. It needs to get into that software so they can automate workflows and optimize. So the interoperability standards are based on process automation across a business, across core functions, rather than thinking about, oh, it goes into the cloud for analytics. You know, put it in the place where you're going to optimize and make decisions, reduce schedules, or tell the trucks where to go, or reroute the material through your plant. So the only way we can do that when we've got software packages from different vendors is make sure that information's sent from the various source systems, triggered by an event, a real time, something's happened rather than a time or a cadence. Um, and that is interpretable by that system that needs to receive it. So they can then action things off the back of it. So this is just a bit of a model to just hopefully just open up your eyes around the appreciation of what goes into, you know, working out a, uh, determining a, a schedule as an example. There's all these different types of um, considerations that go into creating a schedule and any type of physical operation, whether you need data in there or there's a thought in your head or a consideration or assumption. And this is, doesn't include all the data that would be expressed from these different other functions. So there's quite a bit that goes into it, you know, and if you're using spreadsheets or software where you have to manually enter this type of stuff in or make assumptions that don't even get captured anywhere when you're creating these things, then that's that's how far away you are from having these sort of real-time decision support scheduling systems that can help you come up with what the optimal answer is. So there's a fair bit to it. Um, and then it's pretty hard to achieve when you need to get that information from a whole bunch of different processes and systems. <coughs> so why is it important? Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons. There's a, there's first, first and foremost, there's a whole bunch of opportunity that we missed between cadence-based um, exchange of information. We organize ourselves a lot in mining to hand over information based on a certain time of the week or day. Um, that's the first time that other processes or systems understand that's the data. So they've lost that opportunity to react when data actually exists somewhere else in the biz business earlier than that. Um, often when we share data from one complex software to another, because we're handing it over to another human to enter it, we'll simplify it and dumb it down to give them the minimum. And that basically means that the receiving system has no chance to take in extra information and use that to you know, run automated workflows around decision support and those type of things. It's not very efficient, obviously. Um, usually geos and mine engineers don't argue against the fact that they often spend you know 60 plus percent of their time handling data, manually fixing it, either on the way into creating a plan or um, for reporting and those type of things. So there's a lot of wasted hours there of very talented people um, lost when you don't have this sort of um, solution in place. Um, yeah, and then obviously there's a whole lot of errors in data when you manually enter it that flow through the system have to be corrected. So the other thing there is it sort of actually holds back the whole um, technology industry from innovating and moving forward because why would you invest, you know, tens of millions of dollars into building some advanced system that can leverage all this data if it was available in real time if none of your customers can actually provide it because none of their systems share the data. So it does hold back innovation cycles um, when you don't have it, but then opens up a lot of opportunity for rapid innovation when you do. So just to put a bit of contrast against what interoperability is, I guess, you might have a mine scheduling system here, fleet management system, materials tracking, process control plant, and a lab system. If the way information's being exchanged is anything like this, or maybe there's a bit more maturity in some organizations, but this is how data typically flows at most sites that we go out to and have a look at um, between their systems. You know, 
they might not even have um, a materials tracking system, access database. They get their truck factors or counts from the, the fleet. It's handed over at the end of the shift. That's what the little time things mean. You usually have to map data errors and fix them to get them in and run the process. So it's a very slow process. And a lot of mines, um, you know, it's an end of shift, end of 24 hours, plus the time it takes to get the data in there. So you actually never know what your inventory levels are in real time at any time. The closest you ever get is about six hours once a day from the six hours it took you to enter all the data in to when the shift changeover was for the last 24 hours. So, um, and that's where a lot of opportunities lost, obviously. Then you can go into the custom integration. Um, and so I've just drawn on a few, you know, probably pretty common places where people start trying to integrate software in a mine. Usually you don't have it from the planning software just because, you know, how do you interrogate a, a database in the planning software to get the approved plan data? You know, that's a bit of a challenge. Uh, but from systems that are sort of managing the execution, yes, you can do a database replica. You can put some rules in there to map whatever they've keep configured in that fleet management system to how you're going to record that in your materials tracking system or data warehouse. Um, but what you're essentially building in here is a compensating system. You're compensating for the fact that this system doesn't push the data out in a structured message when something happens, like a truck dumps, um, and send all that message to another system that also understands that structure and then can automatically process it. So typically these things are quite fragile to an upgrade of the software that can break things in here. Someone changes master data in here that breaks this, someone makes a historical change that doesn't get captured in the query. Um, and so you end up getting a quite a high uh, cost of ownership and things aren't, information flow isn't based on events in the real world, they're based on arbitrary time triggers of when you're gonna query that database, you know, at, at whatever period. And so it's far from ideal and has a high cost of ownership and doesn't work real well from a planning perspective. And then you get into a sort of interoperable world. Um, and so this is actually a snapshot of a small, um, a, a small part of the architecture that was implemented in a, um, in a mine in uh, West Africa, Bauxite mine. Uh, so they had rail, port and shipping as well. That was all um, integrated the same way. So basically you've got your scheduling software here. Once they've approved the schedule, they'll push a button that publishes the schedule out. That includes um, the, gray, the gray control and dig blocks. Um, so that'll end up in your fleet management system. So straight away you're eliminating that whole file transfer and upload, but also have all that associated with tasks and schedules and start and end times. You can include in that your assumptions uh, around the equipment and the routes. Then what happens, they'll execute this and then they've got an event trigger in here. Every time a truck dumps, a message will be sent um, to any system. Um, so all these messages go to each of these other systems, but also to your central data warehouse. So you still get everything you want for your analytics and reporting. It's all automated, um, but it's a byproduct of this automation of the workflow and the business. Um, so this message will come up and then data mine will, um, um, my market will receive that and then it'll automatically process that transaction of the movement of material and update the balance of the source and destination, calculate the grade, and then it automatically sends the results every time a balance changes in the block or stockpile. And this goes back into the scheduling software because uh, this has a blend scheduling um, optimizer in it. So anytime they choose to run that schedule or that optimizer, it always has the latest information that's known uh, in there. So people talk a lot about the source, you know, one source of the truth. The fact of the matter is there's multiple sources of the truth based on where the data comes from. It's about keeping every system aligned with that source of the truth in a reliable way. Um, and then you can have access to all that data for reports and queries up here without impacting the performance of the systems um, that are being used for operations. Yeah, so mine market in this project was uh, updated to support a whole bunch of these ISA 9 to 5 or B2ML messages. It's actually the same message that's used to send actuals from a fleet management system as it is from a plant to capture the movements and sample uh, registrations through the plant. Um, and also the same message that comes from a, from a lab's uh, LIM software, lab information management software uh, into, the, into the system as well. So it can update the grade balances. Um, 
So just talk a bit about the benefits. And um, again, this was at this particular project. So at this project, they were saving um, 60 hours a day of manual entry. Now, if you just think of the mine pit, that's that's probably you think that that's way too much. What are they doing? Um, but this is across processing, uh, rail, port and shipping, and also lab results coming in through emails and stuff like that. Um, obviously, by eliminating all of that, everyone's a lot happier. They can focus their time on sort of more value add side of things. Um, the real time data provided visibility um, of a whole bunch of opportunities for this organization. And I've got another slide I'll talk to about that. Um, but essentially they went from this post, um, post 24 hours plus entry time, sort of access to what, what happened in the last you know, period to real time understanding of their tons and grade and all their stocking points. And that was really, um, really helpful, especially on the post crush stockpiles or product stockpiles at the mine. They got quite a short rail run to the port. Um, they've got a single car dumper, a single stacker reclaimer. Um, so it makes a lot more sense in the, uh, for them in terms of throughput to just direct load barges straight from the mine. Um, but you can only do that if you're really confident on your grade specs at the mine and they have different contracts with different customers. Um, so different specs to meet and the barge lineup can change at any time on them. Um, so they have to have a good understanding of the grade at the mine stocks to be able to load the train from the right stockpile and then load that straight onto a barge without having an off spec incident uh, or something like that. So having real time visibility was enabled them to do that consistently throughout the year. Whereas prior to that, they would err on the side of caution. They'd make a few decisions to do it. They'd get an off spec. They'd have to get back in their box and then they'd err on the side of caution again. And it really impacted their overall throughput. So, um, so for them, it was worth about uh, 2 million tons per annum solving that problem. Um, so this is a dashboard that you can really only curate and has any uh, utility if you have real-time data from a whole bunch of systems flowing around so you can get the insights not only on what the state of a stockpile is right now um, but also understand confidence in terms of where are those numbers being generated from. Um, so this is a, a post-crush a dashboard for a post-crush um, stockpiles. So they've got a few different stockpiles they're building here. And what you're seeing here is the current best known tonnage and, and grade on the stockpile. Um, but is that grade made up of grade that we've inherited from the block that's been that's gone through a ROM, somewhat been washed out um, and stacked onto the stockpile? Or is that the result from the sample um, analysis that I took on that movement as it went through the plant and it's been applied? So when you just have a number to look at, you can't really tell, you know, what that num what that number's been made up from at any one point in the top, um, in the day. So all this is showing them is that when they look at this number here for this stockpile two six six, right now this is a live da dashboard that refreshes every time something changes. Um, they know that only twenty seven percent of um, the material in that stockpile has had grade applied from the lab through the plant. And, st and the rest of it's made up from what they've assumed from the source, whether that be through ROMs or from the block, obviously less accurate. Whereas on this one here, you can see that they had way more sample results back. So what is it? I can't even make it out. 90 something percent is from the lab. So they're gonna be quite confident no matter what happens on that last five or 6%. If their specs 45, they're pretty much they're not going to go off spec no matter what the um, results of those last few samples are coming through. Um, so the other things they can tell here are the sample turnaround time. They can see whether actually a result was sent from the lab system but hasn't been applied in mine market as well, which tells them there's a technical issue with the solution. So it provides them with a whole bunch of insights that really you can only get if you have access to all these systems and you're monitoring their messages and, and what's flowing through. Um, and none of this is possible without having that interoperability or event triggered messaging between all the processes. Um, I'll just go back up to that diagram again. <coughs> the other, because th <coughs> I think it might be relevant to some people in the in the crowd, maybe. Um, <coughs> this these were owned by the owner operator. These two software packages, and then these um, packages down here were owned by various contractor miners. So. Um, 
we were able to set up the interfaces and do the project with those guys. Like this was um, Bureau Veritas with Sorby Limbs on their own network. So we we're able to set all this integration across that reliably um, and securely and have this real time messaging. So just because you got sort of contractor miners um, in the mix, doesn't mean you can't have this architecture and all benefit from the results. And we're seeing that a lot this year that that's not really a barrier. It's just a matter of conversations and um, getting aligned up front. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, it's quite a, what we've witnessed a fair few times is um, when people are used to sort of going and collecting and checking and cleansing their own data through a visual inspection or what they've heard in a meeting or whatever, um, you know, they end up going with a number that they feel most comfortable with. Um, when you go, oh, don't, you don't have to worry about that now, it's all automated, just trust it. Um, you can get a fair bit of anxiety with going, oh, I'm going to trust this data now. So what we found was really um, a benefit that we didn't really think about too much, you know, prior to going and doing these architectures, but just sort of came with the solution was the fact that we're monitoring all these systems and monitoring all the messages and cues and all that, we know 100% when um the schedule uh, the, the the fleet management um system and the controllers have mined some blocks that weren't sent through from the schedule and that causes an issue because the movements will happen mine market will track those movements but there's no grade moving with those movements in and because there's no grades being given to mine market for, for that block id but we can see that straight away and it can show up and you can give feedback to the mine planner hey don't email the guy the blocks and whatever you need to get the grade in there push the button and then fix up the data um, and that probably just brings me to my last point is this architecture with interoperability has this, I guess, self-healing mechanism. So it has a way, it enforces fixing data at source, but if you get a measurement error from a sensor or someone enters some data in and that gets published in a message straight away, they, if they, um, they fix that data up, it'll send that data referencing the original message as, um, denoted as a correction message. So all the other systems, when they build this capability in, they don't double count that correction. So just say you had a movement go out and it said there was a thousand tons on this truck movement, you've only got 240 ton trucks. Um, all right, it's already processed that and add that to the stockpile. It gets corrected in the fleet management system. Then that sends this message in a particular way. The materials tracking system receives that, even if it's 10 truckloads later, and goes, I'm going to go back to that original transaction, correct the data in that, and then reprocess everything, including the grade and the balance from that point in time, and then send the corrections out. So this type of correction mechanism is implemented in each of the uh, messaging structures in each of the software packages. So you can always correct your own data at source rather than someone else having to do it downstream that doesn't have visibility of what's going on. Um, and I think that's it. Questions? We're doing questions, aren't we? Yep. Yeah.